Okay, so uh, this will be chapter three of my lectures. Uh, so three will be what I will call the graphical representation of topological recursion. So let me recall, uh, well, let me recall uh, that I define o omega gn of z1 zn as some of our all ramification points, residue at ramification points of a kernel that I will call Ka of Z1 Z times, and there was this omega g minus 1 and plus 1 Z sigma A of Z Z2 Zn plus a sum G1 plus G2 equal G and I1 I2 equals Z2, Zn, and this will be, that's what I called the sum prime, but which also means no disk, uh, well, okay, uh, of prod of omega G1, 1 plus I1, Z, I1, omega G2, 1 plus I2, sigma a of z, i2. All right. So, on k a was this quantity, k a of z1 z was one half of integral from sigma a of z to z omega 0 2 of z1 and the dot means the variable that is integrated and omega zero one of z minus omega zero one of sigma i of z. Okay, that was the definition. And let me also uh, let me also define something which it's just a shorter name for omega zero two. Let me just define it as a shorter name. Okay. <coughs> The idea is that we have this recursive definition and we would like somehow to encode it in a way which is uh, uh, convenient for doing computations. Uh, so you see at each step we'll have to take product of k times some other omegas and at the first few steps we'll start with some omega zero two. So we'll have some k times b and something like that. So let me just give an example omega zero three of z1, z2, z3. You see it's uh, sum over a residue at a of ka of z1 z and here we have in that sum well first the first term is absent because we start at genus zero we are at genus zero and in that sum there are exactly two this product contains two terms uh, so we have b z uh, z2 b sigma a of z, z3, plus b of z, z3, b sigma a of z, z2, which are the two possibilities of uh, decomposing the set z2, z3 into disjoint subsets that are not empty. So we have exactly two possibilities, so this is what we have. Uh, so we shall use a graphical convention to write this quantity. And for that, I will represent this as just a line with two, uh, with which forks uh, in a trivalent vertex. And here I will put the variable z and here sigma a of z. And this one, I will represent it as just a line as z1, z2. This one has an arrow, this one has no arrow. So just a convenient way to represent this big formula is just saying this. So somehow we have 
z1, z2, z3, well, so this should be linked, plus z1, z3, z2. Okay. So this is just a graphical convenient notation. What this picture means is exactly the formula above. So it means each time you have an edge with an arrow, you replace it by the corresponding k. Each time you have an edge with no arrow, you will replace it by a b. Okay. Excuse me? No, no arrow means that it's symmetric? Uh, excuse me? No, it's not totally, well, okay, there is a subtlety, which is that Ka is symmetric. It is symmetric, but indeed, when you want to compute carefully the symmetry factors, you have somehow to say that one edge, uh, so somehow there is an orientation here. So the, let's put a, sorry, let's put a dot on the left side and no dot on the right side. So indeed, you should be careful about that. But you have to keep in mind that in fact, k is symmetric. So in fact, all this is also equal to two times this one, z1, z2, z3. So either you put the dot, or you don't put the dot, but you have a symmetry factor two. OK, that's a choice. And in fact, because of this symmetry, the symmetry factors will always be powers of two, basically. OK. Now let's look at another one with this graphical representation. Omega 1, 1 of Z1 is uh, sum over A, residue at A, Ka of Z1, Z. And here, in the big bracket in the right hand side, in fact, the only term is the first one, which is a B of z sigma i of z. So which graphically you represent, there is a k, there is that, and here you have a b. Again, there is that dot. OK, so this is just a graphical representation of that formula. OK. now. Let's consider another one, for instance, omega 1, 2 of z1, z2. Well, according to the formula, it contains sum over a, residue at a, of k a of z1, z. And here you have, in the right hand side, what do you have? You have an omega 0, 3 of z sigma a of z z2 plus uh, omega so so plus an omega uh, an omega zero two so b uh, of z z2 omega one one of sigma a of z plus b of uh, sigma a of z so let me write it the other way omega one one of z b of sigma i of z, z2. OK? So here, this was uh, an omega 0, 3. So let me represent it this way. OK, this is a kind of sphere. This is a sphere. It has genus 0, and it has three variables. OK? This one is what I would represent as a torus with only one leg. It's just a graphical notation. It just means that omega 1, 1, I associated to it the picture of something of genus 1 with one leg, whatever that means. It's just a graphical notation. For the moment, it does not mean anything. In the end, what I would like to prove is that indeed omega gn is something related to mgn. So that's what we will find in the end. But for the moment, this is just a simple graphical notation. Uh, so, so let me continue with some examples. So, omega 1, 2. Let me continue to represent omega 1, 2. So, omega 1, 2, so which is 
a torus with two legs, Z1, Z2, is, according to this formula, this K, Z1, and with two sides, and here I glue an omega Z of 3. An omega Z of 3 is that sphere. Okay, so here there was Z, sigma I of Z, Z, plus, so there is the second term, which is that one. So here you glue a B and that plus, and the third term is Z1. Uh, and here you glue an omega 1, 1 and a B. Okay. So, uh, but now, the idea is to use again that this was already, uh, we have already computed this omega 0, 3. It's the formula above, and it's already a sum of graphs. So the idea is that we replace this by a sum of graphs, by the corresponding sum of graphs. So this is, so we have Z1. And here we start on four Z four. Oh, yes, here it's Z2. It's also Z2 here in the end. OK. OK, so here, omega 0, 3 is that graph. So for instance, let's. OK. Let's write it this way. So here we had z and sigma i of z. And here there will be another variable, let's call it z prime and sigma b of z prime. Okay? So here we will have a vertex a and here a vertex b. So what this is, this is sum over a and b. Residue at z goes to a. So this is the same thing as here. And residue, and when we compute omega 0 of 3, we use another variable. Z prime goes to B. And we have, so in this picture, we have K of Z1, Z. We have a KB of Z, Z prime. And we have a B of sigma I of Z, sigma B of Z prime, and a B of sigma b of sorry of z prime z2 so this big formula is uh, so basically this graph represents that formula it's the same thing okay it's just so this graph is just a notation for that formula but we have many other terms we have yeah but you also can write <coughs> different way in the first term yes you could indeed uh, indeed, you could. So here, we could do. Okay, let me do like that. Okay. So somehow this is the prime, or, or 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 if you want, it's like I put the dot. No, no, no. Let me do that. The prime. So this was z sigma i of z z one z two sigma b of z prime, so k okay, a b, plus, so this was for that term, because omega 0, 3 contain two graphs, and now we can do the same thing here. So we have this, and here we have this, we have, so again we replace omega 0, 1 by its expression, and so we have this, plus, Okay, so in formula, what does this mean? We could put a bracket here, plus b of sigma a of z, z prime, b of sigma b of z prime, z2, plus, so this was the second graph, so now we have z sigma a of z, z prime sigma b of z prime, z2, z1, so we have, so this one will be a B 
of sigma a of z, z prime and a b of z prime, sigma b of z prime, plus the last term is, uh, so if you are careful, b <coughs> of z, z prime, b of z prime, sigma b of z prime. And sorry, times, I forgot the b, I forgot that b, There should be only two b's in each time. So, sorry, I forgot the one with z2. So, there must be a mistake here in that graph. It was z2 here. No, sorry. This was that graph. So, there is a b of zz2, which is missing. And the b, uh, yes, sorry, this was a b of zz2. And here we have a b of Z, z sorry, it's completely wrong. We have this one and we have a b of sigma a of z, z2, which is that one. Okay. <coughs> okay, so this is just, uh, yes. Well, if you are careful, you see that this graph has the same value as this graph because of the symmetry. So in fact, uh, you could write this with a factor two. So in the end, you could also just say that this is two times this graph uh, plus two times this graph. Okay, you could just say that it's equivalent. Sorry, no, they are not planar graphs. Oh, well, you see here, I, well, okay, it's, it's more subtle. It, they are not really planar graphs. Well, in that example, indeed, they are planar, but it's not always the case. And oriented edges for what? Yes, or oriented edges will, but I'm going to write it now. Okay. Oriented edges form a, t uh, form a spanning tree of a graph, always. Uh, it's just because each time you apply the recursion, you always start by, uh, by an edge arrow. So, in fact, so just let me mention that the way of writing the recursion. So, a way of writing the recursion is saying that something of genus G. So, so genus G and with n legs. So, let me put the first one on the left. Okay equals, so according to my recursion is k times, and here you put, either you put something of genus g minus one, and with the same legs, plus, and here, z1, and here you put in all possible ways, so something with genus g1, and here something with g2 and some subsets. Uh, I don't know, some subsets which I called i1 and some subsets which I call i2. So this is the way of writing the recursion. Okay, so let me now state the theorem. So if you ap recursively apply this exactly in the way I did it for the example of omega 1, 2, if you apply this recursively, what do you have? What do you have? So the theorem, which is kind of obvious, uh, which is that omega gn of z1 zn is the sum of our graphs G, which belongs to a set that I will call GGN of Z1 ZN, that will be a set of graphs. And we have a product, so, uh, so I will describe this set, but basically this set of graphs, uh, so G has uh, 2G minus 2 plus N vertices. 
three valent vertices. Uh, it has uh, 3g minus 3 plus n edges. So some of them are oriented. Uh, 2g minus 2 plus n oriented edges forming a spanning tree of the graph and it's a tree with root at z1 so it's always so it's always so basically you will always have something like a tree okay you have a tree the root is always z1 okay and you you're going to have some uh, okay let me take another Okay, and you're going to have uh, also some Bs, some non-oriented ones. So let me complete. So you want the graph to be, uh, okay, let me do that, that, okay. You want the graph to be trivalent. So every vertex is trivalent and uh, it has so n minus 1 external legs are non-oriented and end at z2, zn. Uh, and you have g uh, non-oriented edges that form G loops. So in the end, you have a graph with G loops. Okay, and with, the, but there is a non-local constraint is that those, uh, those internal edges, non-oriented edges, can only go from a vertex to one of its descendants or ancestors. You are not allowed to go from one branch to another. So th these are not Feynman graphs. There are less such graphs than Feynman graphs because of that non-local constraint. Uh, going from a vertex to uh, its descendant. Okay. And there are some additional things. Each vertex carries, a, I will say, color, which is a, which is a, a ramification point, an element of R. So each vertex carries a color A, B, uh, C, uh, D, E, F, G, or something <coughs> like that. And each and, uh, and, uh, and it carries also a variable. So each vertex V carries a color AV and the variable ZV. Okay, and the theorem is that, so this is a residue at ZV goes to AV, so product for all vertices. You have a product for arrowed edges Uh, which are the form V1 going to V2, or let's say V going to V prime, K A V prime of ZV, ZV prime, on the product of non arrowed uh, 
edges b uh, sorry v uh, v prime of some b of z v z v prime. So you see that's exactly what we have been doing, and the proof of that theorem is completely straightforward. What is not totally obvious is that constraint that you want to go only from one vertex to its descendants, but it's basically the way you construct those graphs recursively that implies that, and it's not difficult at all. So for instance, if you want to see what are all the graphs that contribute to this omega uh, one, two, you see that it's all the graphs that I've represented. Uh, also, uh, yes, sorry. Uh, again, uh, at each vertex, there is a left side on the right side. So, or, or if you don't put it, it will be, it will mean you, you will have some powers of two. Uh, okay. Uh, so vertices that are, there is a left vertex, left side on the right side. So let's say that a vertex always look li looks like that. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. At each vertex, there is one ingoing oriented edge, but the outgoing edges can be both oriented or both non-oriented or one oriented, one non-oriented. All possibilities exist. <coughs> so this is very convenient because it allows to represent very easily all those quantities. Uh, so instead of remembering formulas, you just have to remember this procedure and you can, uh, uh, it's easy. And also this graphical representation is really the key to, uh, to proving many of the theorems. For instance, that's how I, I use this representation to prove that the omega GNs are symmetric. And I use this representation to prove, in fact, many of the properties of a topological recursion. This graphical representation is very convenient because it makes things really combinatorial to prove. Uh, so um, the next, yes, another remark is that uh, another representation Uh, it's instead of remember that my k a of z one z, I represent it so far as z one z sigma I of z. But it's also convenient to represent it by a thickening. So instead of having just legs, you thicken the legs, and somehow a three-dimensional representation. But just notice that here, uh, outgoing there is only. In fact, there is only one variable z. Or, or on both legs, the two variables are, are somehow they are the same. One is just the, the copy, uh, another copy of the first one. So you would like to think that there are two outgoing things. So it looks like a pair of pants. But in fact, there is somehow only one boundary which splits into two. So in fact, so somehow it's like a pair of pants, but with a boundary which is a disk that has been pinched at one point. That's the good way of representing things because there is only one modulus associated to the boundary. There is only one boundary, but somehow it will, you can glue two things. So when you go going to glue it, you will have that possibility. So Z1 and somehow here you have Z, but that splits in two. And same thing for the B of Z1, Z2. Well, which was omega zero two of z one z two, which is really so which I represented so far like that, but I will now represent it as just the cylinder z one z two. So, with this representation, for instance, I have that omega zero three of z one z two z three. Now I represent it as this. So now this is truly a pair of points z one z two z three is according to my representation so something like that and here you glue two cylinders z2 z3 
plus the other possibility, so which is Z3 and Z2. And so on. And for instance, omega 1, 1, which would be this quantity, is going to be just that. And here you glue a cylinder. So it's a very inspiring picture. Unfortunately, we are not truly able to give it a meaning in geometry for the moment, but, uh, but it's, I would say it's a beautiful picture. So the idea is that the theorem above says that if you want to compute omega gn, so corresponding to, so basically it says, so the topological recursion first, it says that, that if you have something of genus g with n boundaries, is, well, basically it's all the possibilities to remove, it looks like all the possibilities to remove a pair of pants. So you see here that there is one more hole here. You are indeed creating the extra hole plus Okay, all the possibilities to do that. So this is just a graphical representation of a recursion. For the moment, it does not really mean something. For instance, in the Mirzarani case, uh, for hyperbolic geometry, it is not known what would be the good line to cut to really give a meaning to that representation. It is not known. And <coughs> does it exist? It's not even... The simple ramification points. Yes, yes. For the moment, we have simple ramification points. And in fact, that's my next section. Uh, in fact, this graphical representation allows to f give uh, generalization to higher order ramification points. And that's exactly what I was going to say now. <laughs> uh, so which is my number... So it's just my... 3, 2. Uh, okay. So, so far, indeed, I have given the formula for topological recursion only assuming that we had simple ramification points. So, but this graphical representation make it, makes it easy to define also the case of higher order ramification points. So, that was my higher order ramifications. So remember I have uh, the spectral curve is something, so we have a certain Riemann surface sigma and we have a projection to the base, so sigma and sigma zero and we have that projection which I call x. And uh, typically, near a simple ramification point, in the vicinity of a simple ramification point, the map is 2 to 1. And there are exactly two branches that can be exchanged, exchanged by an involution. Now, assume that we have a higher order ramification point uh, somewhere, uh, where we have several branches coming to... So now, in the vicinity, we have not a 2 to 1 map, but... A n to 1 map. So imagine A, A uh, a ramification point of order dA. And uh, dA larger than 2. So dA is the number of branches that meet at this point. And which means that locally there is a group, uh, there is a local, let me say, local Galois group GA uh, that permutes the branching, the branches. Uh, so it means that if sigma, uh, sigma 
belongs to GA uh, is more or less equivalent to say that x of sigma of z equals x of z in a neighborhood of A. Typically, they are cyclic group, but when you go to, uh, uh, I think when you go to um, cameral uh, curves for Hitchin system, it can be something, well, uh, well, there is the possibility to take something more. But yes, indeed, for, for curves, this is really cyclic group. So typically, this would be a ZDA. So indeed, for a simple ramification point, this is Z2, GA contains exactly two elements, the identity and an involution. But for higher order points, it can be, a high, it can be something more. And so let me define what I would call, so for, so for every K uh, such that K is between 2 and the order of GA, let me define uh, the equivalent of a kernel K, but now it will carry a small K. So somehow this one was the K2, KA of Z1 of, okay, let me call that, uh, that one P and let me call all the over z1 up to zk. Okay. For the moment, they are like independent variables. Excuse me? Well, put, put z1 in the front. Yeah. Yeah. It's what was okay. 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 Let, let me. Okay. Let me change the notation. Z1. Yes. P1. Pk. Okay. Let me change my notations a little bit, so that it's not confusing. Uh, and so, by definition, it will be, but it will be slightly different from the previous one. Uh, it will be integral from A to P1 of omega 0, 2 of Z1. And so, the dot means the variable which we integrate. And the integration path is taken within the neighborhood of A. And product from j equals 2 to k of omega 0 1 of p 1 minus omega 0 2 of p k of p j so this is just the product and i will represent that instead of representing it as before as something with so we it has a z1 and here instead of having two things on the right hand side, it will have k of them. So p1 up to pk. So it will be represented as in this way. Are they only ordered, sorry? Are they ordered p1? No, they are not ordered. Not oh, no, sorry, sorry. In the different, so, sorry. No, yes, yes, they are ordered. But in the end, it's yeah. exactly like before, there is the symmetry, which is that the value, in fact, will be, the value uh, given by topological regression will be independent of that order. No, but no, for the moment. Z1 as well, because. Yes. So yes, Z1 yeah. plays a totally different role. Z1. Uh, but there, they are symmetric with respect to all variables. No. No, no, K was not symmetric at all. No, no, K is not symmetric. Yeah, yeah. but also the integral is different from G group because Sorry. it's integral from uh, reflected points to P. Yes, but not now. Ah, so and, I, and I had, yes, before I was taking, f I was not starting from A, I was starting from uh, sigma of P1, yeah. and I had a one half in front. Yeah, so it's different. Even so it's different. Yeah. But it will give the same uh, result for the topological recursion. Ah, so, it's so it's different. So somehow, before, what I had defined was the symmetrization of that one. But since everything is symmetric in the end, you can indeed symmetrize, and that gives the same result. But so now the definition, the definition is that omega g n of z1 z n equals. So I will need some little space, sum over all branch points. 
sum over all k equals 2 to the order of the group residue at p let's say let's call it p goes to a and here i will put okay no let's put me put that before sum over all subsets so this is a notation a is a subset oh, so included in g a minus identity so i will take all subsets of my group except identity and i will take all subsets of cardinal k minus 1 so that's just a notation to say to say subset of cardinal a min k minus 1 okay so now i will have uh, residue at z goes to a uh, k a k of z1 which was my first variable here and the next variables are z and all the uh, set of sigma of z for all sigma belonging to A. So I have k minus one of them, so that makes k variable here. It's fine. Okay. Times. And now I have something that's uh, going to be like the, the product of omegas that appear in the right hand side or a sum of product of omegas I, just before writing it in letters let me write it graphically so graphically what i want to say is just the following thing uh, yes. Graphically, what I want to say is basically nearly the same picture as below, except that now I have not only two, but I can add three, four, and so on. So what I want to say is that is the following. Okay. One, two, uh, up to n. Okay. Is the sum over all possibilities. So you have here k of them, so you have that sum over k. Okay, this was z1, z2, zn. Okay, let me, read here you have g, g. And here, uh, so k equals 2 to g a. And here you can glue things. Uh, some of them can get disconnected. So for instance, like that. So here you, you can have uh, something like that. Okay, that could be a possibility. Okay, you have to split into all possible ways. So either you could have one connected piece or two disconnected, I mean uh, two connected components or three connected components. Uh, the only thing you want, uh, well, one thing you want is that every of the z2 up to zn variables here in the right hand side must be connected to something there i mean for instance you are not allowed uh, to do something like that uh, and uh, here are something uh, like that uh, well i mean you, you you don't want something like that okay but it's just that when we are going to write the, the sum of products, we have to be careful that we don't have such things. Okay? Uh, so we have all possibilities to do that. Just remark one thing, if you have L components, if you have L components, if you add all the Euler characteristics, so some from I equals one to L of chi I, the Euler characteristics, plus the Euler characteristics of that, which is a sphere with k plus 1 boundaries. So plus 2 minus k plus 1. The whole Euler characteristics must be 2 minus 2g minus m, of course. So which puts the constraints on the genus that you can have here. Okay. 
And the constraint on the genus is just that all these genus, G1, G2, and so on, you will have that sum from i equals 1 to L of Gi, which must be equal to G minus k plus L. In, in the end, that's all what this says. So that's what we are going to have in this. So, so here we have that sum of Gi equals G minus k plus L. So if we want to write the precise definition of a bracket, which is here, we have to take all the possibilities to split those k things into parts. So it's the sum of our partitions. So let me write it as sum of our partitions. Sum of our mu equals partitions of k elements of those elements of z on the set uh, z, the set of sigma a of z when sigma belongs to A. So these are partitions. And uh, so partitions means I don't order the subsets. Okay, it's, it's important for the symmetry factors. So some of our partitions. And now when I have chosen some partitions, so for instance, this, is, this will be my first part and this will be a second part. Okay, when I've chosen those parts, I have to decide to what I glue them to. Okay, so now for each choice of partition, I have to. Uh, so let's say my mu is mu1 of mu l. These are my parts. So now I have to take sum over g1 plus, as I say, gl equals g minus k plus l, and sum over i1. I L must be equal to all my external variables. Uh, well, why, why mu equals to the vector mu one to mu L? Yes. But mu is equal to also partition. So, so, so it means that these are the parts. Well, I'm, it's just a notation to say that it's, uh, it's the parts. But how do you know that there will be L parts? Well, L is by definition the number of parts. But that should be equal to this, uh, since sigma, it depends, the partition depends on the sigma. So yeah. sigma is coming from this cardinality k yeah. minus 1. Well, in fact, no, the partition really depends only on the cardinal of sigma. So how do you, how it is equal to L? But it's L part. The L is the number of parts. So the definition is L. Set, set is yes. or cardinality L, k. L equals the number of parts of mu. So k, okay. set of cardinality k, you divide it in L part. So L depends on mu. It's an L of mu. L of mu. So I should write it this way, L of mu. Okay. So L is a function of mu. Some partitions have one part, some partitions have two parts, some partitions have three parts. And at most, they can have k parts. So um, now we have the product from 1 equals to the number on all parts of omega gi of, now we have the cardinal of the part mu i plus the cardinal of the part of the set i i. Well, the, the main difference is that parts cannot be empty, whereas sets can be empty. Parts cannot be empty by definition of a partition, but sets Uh, here in the union of sets, the sets can be empty. Uh, of and you have mu i and i i. Okay, so that's it. Uh, with a restriction, and it's the same as before, no disk. You want you want to have never an omega zero one appearing in the right hand side. May I return to this k with many variables, yeah? P1, yeah. P1 okay. Do you understand correctly that P1 is distinguished? Yes. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's symmetric, yeah? Yes, in the end of the day, it's symmetric. So that works. Okay, that's the definition. So this is the definition 
of the topological recursion when you have higher order branch points. And the other one was just a special case of that one when all branch points are for all order one. Yeah, it was a different question. P1 is distinguished. Can the form of P1 is distinguished from? Yes, indeed. Indeed, P1 is distinguished. But in the end, the result is independent of how you distinguish it somehow. Yeah. So, so that's the definition for higher order branch points. And there is a very beautiful thing is that, well, there is one easy way to obtain higher order branch points is by, uh, so a, an easy way of obtaining a higher order branch point is taking a limit of several simple branch points coming together. And so we have a definition of the omega GNs when we have only simple branch points. And now we take a limit where several simple branch points coalesce together. And then we have another definition of a topological recursion. Is the limit of the first one equal to the other one? And the answer is yes. So that's a theorem. Uh, if so, limits of, well, I'm not going to write it in full details, but uh, simple branch points. Uh, those two high order branch points. Well, in that limit, well, basically what the theorem says is that the limit of omega gn equals the omega gn of the limit. Okay, so omega gn is continuous. Uh, I will later say how omega gns are related to uh, integrals over mgn. And in that case, so it's all related to the, um, well, to given tal formalism. On, okay, I'm not going to enter the details, but basically this theorem says that the ancestor <coughs> potential is continuous. Ancestor potential. The total ancestor <coughs> potential, that's what, so basically Milanov used this theorem to prove that the total ancestor in, uh, in um, uh, is continuous and that has lots of consequences, like for instance, it allows to prove uh, faber pandari pandé uh, conjectures about uh, our spin intersection numbers related to usual intersection numbers. So, because simple branch points will be related to intersection numbers, and higher order branch points can be related, for instance, to R spin intersection numbers. And so this theorem says that you, have, you can obtain R spin intersection numbers as limits of usual intersection numbers. Uh, let me mention that this theorem is not trivial at all. Because, for instance, if you call epsilon the distance between two branch points, two simple branch points, each term in the formula seems to have poles in powers of epsilon. So it seems that e each term could diverge as epsilon goes to zero. But when you take the sum of all terms, in fact, all the poles disappear, and there is a limit, and the limit is equal to that. So it's not trivial at all, but it's true. Uh, Does it all work for the curve has a very bad singularity? No, no, OK. Uh, it works if the coalescing branch points lead to a smooth uh, higher order Spec branch points. So the spectral curve is still smooth. So I did not write all the details. In fact, there is another theorem when it is not smooth uh, that I'm not going to talk about now. But, but again, in fact, the topological recursion is always somehow well behaved under those limits. Uh, it always, in some sense, commutes with the limits, except that it, when it's not smooth, it's after a rescaling that it commutes. Uh, but still, it's, I mean, the basically the limit of a topological recursion is always the topological recursion of a limit up to some rescaling. So it's well behaved and it can also be compared to the Crepant resolution conjecture. And, uh, well, okay. Um, but so, let me now go to something else. Yeah, I understand that you will not maybe explicitly say, but can you explain this limit thing? Uh, okay. Let's take, the, let's take the example of x of z equals uh, z to the r, uh, z to the r uh, 
plus epsilon z. Well, let's put epsilon to be r minus 1z. Okay? dx, okay, let me put minus r. Okay. And, okay, when you take the, you see that when epsilon equals 0, you have uh, 0 is a branch point of order r. Okay? And when epsilon is not equal to 0, uh, dx of z is basically it's uh, r uh, z to be r minus 1 minus epsilon r minus 1. Okay, so which means that the zeros of dx are epsilon times the roots of unity, uh, 2 pi i uh, j over r minus 1. Am I right? Yes. So, so basically you have several, so you have here, uh, you have several roots of unity, okay? Each of them is a simple branch point. So let's call them AJ. Okay, each of them is a simple branch point. When epsilon equals zero, you have only one branch point at zero, which is of higher order. Okay, so the question is, if you compute the topological recursion with that curve for epsilon non-zero, you use the usual formula for the topological recursion, you find some omega gns, do they have a limit when epsilon goes to zero? And the answer is yes, and the limit is precisely the one I computed there. And it's not trivial because each term can have negative powers of epsilon. For instance, k, the kernel k has negative powers of epsilon. But it turns out that this, when you sum all the graphs on everything... Which one is easier to compute? It really depends. Uh, no, in fact, well, the last one is probably easier to compute, yeah. Well, no, it, it really depends on your problem. Uh, uh, well, I mean, in the end, you know that there is no pole in epsilon, but it's not obvious from the definition. When you take the first definition, so when epsilon non-zero, each term has poles uh, in epsilon, but when you take the sum of all branch points and so on, all the poles disappear. And there is a limit when epsilon goes to zero. It's not a trivial theorem. So uh, let me now uh, say something else. So now let me go to the third part. And I'm going to go into your business. <laughs> but so, uh, so this will be my third part, which is, uh, which I called, well, okay. I called it ABCD tensors. Okay, uh, which is really what uh, Maxim and Jan uh, introduced. Uh, so, um, okay, so let me just make first a remark, which is that uh, since the topological recursion is computing always residues at branch points everything will be just in the end combinations of the Taylor expansion coefficients of the residues at branch points. And remember that sometimes we had uh, some residues with some Ka, okay, le let me write for instance this way, uh, and here we have a B of Z, Z2. We are going here to take a residue at Z going to Z very close to A, so we need to tailor expand, so, uh, sorry, this was omega zero two. We need to do the tailor expansion of this omega zero two when Z is close to a branch point, but with Z two arbitrary. So let's do this tailor expansion. So let me take, so let's come back to the simple branch points. Everything could be done for higher order branch points, but let me go to that case for simplicity. So the local variable near A 
instead of, so z was an abstract point on the curve, but lo, so let me give re uh, zeta a of z, which is just square root of x of z max minus x of a. So this is a good local variable. I'm just a bit confused. You are taking a as a ramification point, not the branch point. Yes, ramification point, sorry. Okay, uh, I should say ramification. So, excuse me, I, or I often make the confusion between the two. I'm just some image of the ramification. Yes, yes, yes. The branch point is the image of a ramification point on the base curve. Yeah. You're, you're right. So, but it's kind of abuse of language I make from time to time. Uh, so, okay. So, this is a good local coordinate in the neighborhood of a branch point. And in that coordinate, the involution is just uh, changing zeta to minus zeta. Uh, but so, the idea is now we want to expand omega 0, 2 in that coordinate. Omega 0, 2 of z, z2. Uh, we would like to expand it. Uh, so, in two powers of zeta, uh, let me leave some space. Zeta a of z to some power, d zeta a of z. It's because it's uh, to some power. Okay, let me take directly the odd powers. Uh, no, sorry, even powers. 2k. And times a coefficient. And the coefficient will be a one form in the variable z2. And let me give the name to it, xa a k of z2. So it's just the name of that coefficient. Up to a detail, I like to put a minus sign. I like to put a 2 to the power k on the 2k minus 1 double factorial. OK. This is just a, it will be more convenient for practical applications. The plus terms which you ignore. Yes, plus uh, the odd part. And which will play no role because each time, because of the symmetry of k, so somehow all the odd terms will always disappear from the end of the computation. Okay. So these are so another way of saying that is that xi a of k of z two, let's call it, is the residue is simply minus two k minus one double factorial over two to the k residue when z goes to a of uh, 1 over zeta a of z to the 2k, uh, omega 0, 2 of z, z2. So it's simply that. Yes, it must be 2k plus 1 or 2k minus 1. Yes, 2k plus 1. Yes, yes, of course. Yes. OK, so it's just the definition. So that's just the definition. These are the coefficients in the Taylor expansion of omega 0, 2. And so it's obvious from the definition of a topological recursion that all what you will get in the end will be combinations of those coefficients, just because that's the only thing residues can do. All curve minus ramification points, yeah. Yes, they have poles at ramification points. So in fact, it's easy to see that xi a k of z behaves as uh, 1 over zeta a of z to the power 2k times while well, there is a power, uh, did I write it? Um, no, I forgot. So uh, while well, there is a 2k, 2 to the k, 2k minus 1 factorial but uh, plus analytic at A. So basically there is a polar part times uh, something like 2k two, two minus 1 double factorial over 2 to the k, something like that, uh, plus analytic at A. So it means that taking Subtracting that to that is holomorphic at A. Yeah, and analytic in all other things as well, yeah. Yes, and analytic everywhere. So it's, that's the only pole. So it's a pole of order 2k, and there is no other pole. Maybe it's 2k plus 2. I think it's 2k plus 2. 
So is it an assumption that there is no other pole, or is it? No, no, it's, it's by definition of this. The only pole of this can be at A. There can be no other pole. Uh, it's a consequence of that definition. So now let me say something which is kind of obvious, but very deep. So that, uh, let's say, let's call it a proposition. Omega Gn of Z1, Zn is a certain combination of, let's say, let's so we have pairs A1, D1, A2, D2, An, Dn of, so basically we will have a coefficient, a coefficient, le let me leave some space, i equals 1 to n of xi ai di of zi. So basically in each variable zi, we can have only those things. And the coefficient, let me give a name, fgn of, so I take your notation, a1 d1, a2 d2, Okay. So there exist such coefficients. It's just because every raise you formula is just going to do that, it cannot do something else. Now the question is, what are those coefficients? And if you write the topological recursion, it gives a recursion among the coefficients. Uh, it gives a recursion among the coefficients. Well, no, first let me say what are so for examples. Uh, and so, sorry, on the coefficients, sorry, another property is that the coefficients fgn must be, uh, well, first this sum is finite. It's easy to see that the sum is finite, again, because by taking residues, you always extract only a finite number of uh, terms in the Taylor expansions, and the sum is finite, and the coefficients fgn are polynomials of the Taylor expansion coef of omega 0, 1 and omega 0, 2. And remember that I had written that omega 0, 1 near a branch point A was something like, uh, was something like, again, I put some uh, powers, I think there was a 2 to the k. Let I define it this way. Plus some k, t a k, uh, 2 to the k over 2 k plus 1, I think it was double factorial, zeta a of k, uh, zeta a of z to the power of 2k plus 1 times 2 zeta a of z d zeta a of z and I think there is a 2 here so basically it says that the fgns will be polynomials of those coefficients t a k s and polynomials of omega 0 2 of z1 z2 if I expand that in a vicinity so let me leave some space. If I expand that in a vicinity when z1 is close to a and z2 is close to b, let me subtract the pole delta a b d zeta a of z1 d zeta b of z2 over zeta a of z1 minus zeta b of z2 to the square. Okay, there must be some Taylor expansion coefficients some k on L, uh, sorry, and here there was plus, of course, even part. And here also I'm going to write only the part that has the good symmetry, k L, and let's call the coefficients 2 to the k plus L, 2k minus 1 double factorial, 2L minus 1 double factorial, B, A, K, B, L, 
zeta a to the to k, zeta b of z2 to the 2l, d zeta a of z1, d zeta b of z2. Okay, so the FGNs, so what we get is that the FGNs, FGN equals a polynomial of the T AKs on the B uh, AK BL. It must be in a, a polynomial of all those variables. In fact, if you think about it, of how the recursion worked, remember that uh, B, so which was uh, so omega zero two, appeared. Uh, there is an omega zero two for each non-arrowed edge in the graphs, and the k was in fact it contained an integral of omega zero two. So somehow the coefficients of omega zero two appear uh, for each edge of a graph. So in the end, in those variables, this is a polynomial uh, of degree. Uh, 3g minus 3 plus n, which was the number of times they can appear. And for the TI case, it's more complicated. It can be a polynomial of higher. Well, the, the degree of a polynomial in the TI case is more subtle, but let me write some examples. Well, when you compute omega 0, 3 of z1, z2, z3, you can compute it using the recursion formula, and the result is very simple. It's sum over a, t a zero, xi a zero of z one, xi a zero of z two, xi a zero of z three. That's the final answer for omega zero three for any spectral curve. It's very very simple. So what does it mean? Is that the coefficients f zero three uh, basically, many coefficients are, are zero, uh, except so the only coefficients that are non-zero are this one, a zero. So with the same a equals t a zero. That's the only non-vanishing coefficient in this polynomial. Okay. Another one that's interesting is omega one one. So let me write the coefficients of omega 1, 1. And let me write just the coefficients that are non zero. A d, sorry, A 1 equals, I think it's 1 over 12 or 1 over 24. Uh, sorry, it's 1 over 12 t a 0 and f 1 1 of a0 is 1 over 12 ta0 ta1 plus uh, plus ta0 pa0 a0 so that's an example and you can compute it, um, so which means that you can see what omega one one is, but it's just that. Of course, this one over twenty four, uh, sorry, one over twelve, you are going to see it's an intersection number, and we are going to see that in the in a moment. But just la now, let me say that the recursion, so the topological recursion, implies a recursion on the coefficients fgn. And let me collectively note those coefficients alpha 1, alpha n, where alpha is a pair ad. Okay. But now let me say that alpha 1, uh, that the alphas are in a set, whatever it is. Uh, so it's the set, they belong to a set of indices. Okay. 
They belong to a set of indices. And what is the recursion? The recursion can be written in the following way. Uh, so, so there exists. So basically, there exists. So there exists. So the theorem. There exists four tensors that I will call A, B, C, D. Uh, this three will be rank three tensors, and this one will have rank one. Okay. And the definition is just so the definition uh, of D is just D alpha will just be the coefficient f11 of alpha by definition. The a of alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 will just be by definition the coefficient of f03. So that's the definition. So for, for the moment, the theorem says nothing. And the subtlety, no, so now the, the interesting thing is that fgn of, so now for 2g minus 2 plus n uh, larger than 1, fgn of alpha 1 alpha n equals sum over, let's call them beta and gamma, uh, of c of alpha 1 beta gamma times, and here we have our usual combination fgn of n plus 1 gamma delta alpha 2 alpha n plus sum g1 plus g2 equals g and i1 i2 equals alpha 2 alpha n f g1 1 plus i1 beta i1 f g2 1 plus cardinal of i2 gamma i2 except that now I, sub I take in the sum I don't want f01 but I also don't want f02 so that's what I will call stable which means no disk and no cylinder. So it's a stronger thing. Plus, so this was, this is the end of that parenthesis, plus sum over sum from j equals 2 to n, sum over beta. of the tensor B alpha 1 alpha J beta times F G N minus 1 of beta. And you take alpha 2 to alpha N, but you remove alpha J. So this theorem is totally obvious from the definition on writing what the C's and the B's are is, uh, is really, I mean, I can give you the explicit formula of the C's and the B's. Basically, they are computed as residues involving K and B, uh, okay? Uh, so they are just very simple combinations. But the interesting thing is that it takes this very general form that now you, well, now the question you could ask is, okay, take four tensors, A, B, C, D, and apply this recursion, what does it give? Did you, did you say why they are tensors? Well, it just means that they depend on three indices. But that's a good question. Yeah. No. Yeah, okay. Okay, to, 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 okay. 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 to make three of them tensor, you need to say that they are the coefficients of some tensors corresponding to some choice of vector space. So we have to, to build a vector space on all that. I'm not going to enter the details, but for, it's, for the moment, it just means that it's a function of three discrete indices. It's just the coefficients of something when you choose. And, and to say they are tensors, you, you should say how they transform when you change the basis in that vector space and all that. 
I'm not going to do that. The experts are here. <laughs> yes, some of them are up indices, some of them are low indices, but I don't want to enter the details, but I'm just going to cite your theorem. Uh, I'm just going to cite your theorem, which is that, um, sorry. So it's a tensor in a classical sense, not in algebraic sense of extending the scalars from, I thought that. No, 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 no. What? A limit of tensor product of some spaces. Yeah, okay. Okay, but let me just say, uh, so the theorem of Konsevich and Soibelman, uh, which is probably from last year, no, 2017 or 16, 17 or 16, I don't remember, but it's very recent. Uh, but so your theorem is that now, if you define the, let's define the following function. So let's, uh, so define, a vector, an infinite dimensional vector, let me call it x, which will be, uh, which will be the, which has coordinates x alpha, alpha belongs to the, okay, no, sorry, a is not a good set, um, a good name, okay. Well, they, so the indices alpha just belong to a certain set, whatever it is, and x is just a vector with coordinates x alpha, I'm going to define a function of x, which is exponential sum over g. So it will be depend on two things, x and h bar, h bar to the g minus one, sum over n, so everything is in the exponential, sum over n, one over n factorial, sum over alpha one, alpha n, x alpha one, x alpha n, fgn of alpha 1, alpha n. So somehow, I'm just saying that I take the fgns as the Taylor expansion coefficients of some function. So I just define a function from the Taylor expansion coefficient, from its Taylor expansion. I also introduce an h bar corresponding to the expansion in powers of g. And I define that function. Okay, that's the definition. It really makes sense if the, the edgeNs are symmetric. Sorry, it's formal. It's a formal series. Okay, for the moment, it's just a formal series. But the main theorem is that it is, there are some operators that annihilate it. And those operators are defined as, so define the operators L alpha, which is h bar d over dx alpha minus one half of sum over beta and gamma, uh, so, so let me call A alpha beta gamma x beta x gamma plus two times B of alpha beta gamma x beta d over dx gamma, so h bar d over dx gamma plus C alpha beta gamma h bar d over dx beta h bar d over dx gamma okay minus h bar d of alpha okay that's the definition of some infinite family of operators you have an infinite family of operators on the theorem then for every alpha L alpha applied to psi equals zero. Well, and there is a kind of, you can go somehow backwards. So if you have a psi that's, that is annihilated by those operators, then, uh, then the coefficients fgn have to satisfy this recursion somehow. But uh, there are some uh, subtleties, which is that uh, first, is there a psi <laughs> annihilated by that? Uh, so, and for that, you have to say that the L alpha should satisfy some commutation relations. Should be close on the leap bracket, yeah. Sorry? The space yes. should be close on the that's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. So basically, one requirement is that the L alpha should uh, satisfy a certain relation that sum over gamma, and let me call the coefficient f alpha beta gamma, L gamma. So they should form a Lie algebra. 
And in fact, so now you can ask the question, given four tensors A, B, C, D, if I take arbitrary four tensors A, B, C, D, and I define recursively FGN by this formula, will I get something interesting? The answer is, in general, no, for just some simple reason. If the tensors A, B, C, D are completely arbitrary, FGN will not be symmetric in the variables. So there is a constraint on A, B, C, D. And this yes, and this is the constraint. Yes, exactly. This is the constraint on A, B, C, D. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but indeed, you, you discovered that. So uh, the constraint on A, B, C, D is that there is such relations. But again, those relations are not so trivial to solve. And, and basically, what are the tensors A, B, C, D that satisfy those relations? Well, that's what you have called a quantum area structure. So, uh, but, the, but basically what I want to say is that it's not easy to find examples of ABCDs that satisfy this. So for which the FGN are symmetric, it's not easy to find some of them. But you see that if we started the other way around from a spectral curve, we always get something that satisfies that. The question is somehow, is there really something else uh, that satisfies that? Uh, for me, it's not totally clear at the moment what else uh, there could be. Uh, and I'm not sure you <laughs> Yes, but, but I, in fact, we have many generalizations of topological recursion, which I did not talk about, which go into the non-commutative realm. And I think this could, in fact, be uh, in it. So, and also, I said that so far, I was considering only cases where there is a finite number of ramification points. So the, the number of ramification points was finite. But if you allow it to be infinite with some grading, something to, to, make a, to, to, to give a meaning to the sum, uh, I believe that then it could be this generalization that you are talking about. So, in fact, so it's not clear to me how uh, different those structures are really. And, and I think the, the, the answer is not known at the moment. Excuse me? Sorry? G, G starts from zero, so there is a, yes, G equals zero to infinity. So there is a first, the first power is negative. Uh, so exactly like you have usually in WKB expansions. It starts, so it starts typically with exponential one over h bar. So which means that to really give a meaning uh, uh, for that as a power series, you really have to take the log and multiply by h bar to really give a meaning. And then uh, when you want to apply the operator, well, uh, somehow exponentials commute well with operators. So you could rewrite everything only in terms of what is in the exponential. But h bar is complex here. No, no, it's formal variable. It's a formal variable, it doesn't. So, 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 so since h bar has a negative power in the leading term. So, so this means that this equation is true for, uh, by, as an expansion in powers of h bar. It means that all the coefficients of powers of h bar give zero. So you cannot check h bar goes to zero. It's this limit doesn't. No, you, you can because you have h bar yeah. in the coefficients. Well, there is a kind of limit h bar. No, well, no. Psi, no, psi, psi is divergent as h bar going to zero. Psi is divergent, but uh, but many quantities are somehow have a meaning that as h bar going to zero. But I don't want to to go into deeper details about that. But so. Basically, this is the way, uh, this is an algebraic way of rephrasing the topological recursion. Uh, so the idea is you uh, can have some vector spaces, tensor over it, uh, some of those quantum area structures. It also leads to the same topological recursion. But now I want to go to, to, to intersection numbers. What is the Hamiltonian of this system? Sorry? Uh, well, you should ask them. <laughs> no, this is a wave function. Well, you can, I mean, if you introduce L dagger, you can write the number operator and what it is. Well, yes, it's somehow the other constraint. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, okay, no, I think it was here. Okay, but la now let me go to moduli spaces. Is this supposed to be a fundamental Sorry? 
Well, I, I suggest that you pursue this, this discussion later. I don't want. I, I, I want now to move to something else. So, in fact, the idea is that now we would like. So the idea is omega g n. We saw it in the case of Mirzarani, was uh, something like an integral over some m g n of something. Could it be the case in general? And in fact, our graphical representation will allow to say that yes, it is. And I want to say exactly. And so I also show you those coefficients f g n in some examples. For instance, this f 1 1 has a 1 over 24. And so it's very suggestive that there are intersection numbers. And in fact, I also say that all these coefficients f g n are universal polynomials of the t's and the b's. Okay? They are universal polynomials. So you can, uh, so one way to compute them is take some specially special examples of spectral curves where you know what they are. So you take your favorite examples and you compute them. And it was so using that, it was possible. There is a theorem that I'm going to write in a minute, saying exactly what are those polynomials in terms of intersection numbers. So basically, the coefficients are combinations with intersection numbers. So, uh, but for before, I want to introduce intersection numbers. So, I, I, well, some of you know very well what they are, but I want to be introductive. So, I'm, so let's define uh, MGN is the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of G with n marked points on modulo isomorphisms. Uh, basically, uh, two surfaces with marked points are isomorphic if there is a map from one to the other, uh, the other which is holomorphic. So basically, this is a set of, you have a Riemann surface of some genus G, and you have n marked points, P1 up to Pn, OK, of some genus. Uh, and the marked points are labeled. So it means that you, so in the isomorphisms, I don't allow to exchange P1 with P2, for instance. P1 is 1, as number, as label 1 attached to it. Okay. Uh, there is another space which is very useful. So these are just smooth Riemann surfaces. Well, it is known that this is a finite dimensional uh, manifold, uh, but non-compact of dimension. And it, it has a complex structure, and it's of, of complex dimension, uh, 3G minus 3 plus N. OK, yes, sorry, I forgot here to say that. Assume that 2G minus 2 plus N is positive. OK? OK, and the compactification uh, has been defined by Deligne and Mumford. The compactification of this is nearly the same thing. But now we shall allow surfaces to be non-smooth, P1, Pn. And they are what I call nodal and stable. And so it means that now uh, sigma Gn can be something like that. It can be made of several components. Uh, even some of them can do that with some genus. Some of them can be spheres. And the, sorry, the marked points, well, OK, let me put them like that. OK, some components can have several uh, marked points. Some can have none. Sorry, this is not stable. OK, now it's stable. <laughs> uh, OK, and the constraint, so nodal means that there are nodal points. OK, you can always desingularize no nodal points by saying that the nodal point somehow will become a pair of marked points. Uh, I will use that. And just so now th these are the points P1, P2, up to Pn. And to say that it belongs to MGN, you want the total Euler characteristics to be 2G minus 2 plus N. So sum of all the Euler characteristics, so 2 minus 2GI 
minus number of special points. So for each i, must be equal to 2 minus 2g minus n. And stable means that every such thing must be negative. So every component must have a strictly negative Euler characteristic. That's what means stable. So this is the stability. Means that every Euler characteristics of every component must be strictly negative. <coughs> and somehow this is the this is the completion of that space. This is the closure of that space under a topology that I'm not going to describe. Uh, and and this, has, uh, this is a quite complicated space because it has, uh, so it's not, uh, it's not a manifold, it's not even an orbifold, it's a stack. Uh, okay, but I'm not going to, to enter that. So it's orbifold. It's orbifold. But there are components of different dimensions. Sorry? No, 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 no. It's orbifold. It's local, it looks like a quotient orbifold, yeah. but I'm proof. Like MJ as well. Okay. Uh, okay, but I mean there are components of different dimensions. No, it's stratified. Yes, it's stratified. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. It's just I'm not familiar with the names. But so I just want to define now the, um, the cotangent bundle. So the cotangent bundle. So over each. Uh, so it's it's just so I, I will define the bundle L i. Over. Mgn or over Mgn bar, it's defined for both. Uh, so I will take define this uh, with i equals one to n. It's the bundle whose fiber is the cotangent space, so fiber over a point sigma gn p1 pn is the cotangent space uh, of sigma gn at pi. <coughs> so over each point pi, at each point pi you have a cotangent space, which is a one-dimensional space. So it's uh, so locally it's isomorphic to C. So it's a line bundle. It's a line bundle. Well, uh, it's a line bundle. Okay, it's a line bundle. And since it's a line bundle, you can compute its charm class. And it has only one charm class since it's of a dimension one line bundle. Uh, the charm class, it's called psi i, is C1 of Li. And it's a two form on MGN bar. It's a two form, and you can integrate it on cycles of MGN bar. But since it's a two-form, you could integrate it on a two-cycle. Uh, if you want to integrate on the full MGN bar, you, you need a form of a good dimension. And so you're going to define. So, so definition of intersection numbers. So uh, there is a notation, but basically, if so, if d1 plus dn equals 3g minus 3 plus n, and now uh, from now on I will always write dgn equals 3g minus 3 plus n. It's shorter to write. Then you define uh, you define. Um, so it's just a notation tau d1 tau dn index g, it's a notation, is the integral over the full mgn bar of psi 1 to the power d1, psi 2 to the power d2, psi n to the power dn. This is now a form of a good dimension. This is a form which has the correct dimension to be a, a maximal dimensional form. You can integrate it over the full space. And this is typically, uh, typically it belongs, it's a number, and it's typically a rational number. It belongs to Q, and it's even a positive uh, number. 
Ouais, bien, bien, ça va être dans Q+. OK. And so these are numbers. And they are called the intersection numbers, and it's only a definition. And just a remark, if d1 plus dn is not equal to 3g minus 3 plus n, you shall, you shall divide them as 0. So it's very convenient because we will write sums and basically every sum where the condition of degrees is not satisfied will somehow disappear from the sum. Uh, okay, just to give you some examples that are known, tau 0, tau 0, tau 0, 0 is 1. Uh, tau 1 in genus 1 is 1 over 24 and so on. I mean, okay, there are such numbers. And uh, they are reminiscent of the coefficients f0, 3 and f1, 1 that we had before. And I want to state, uh, so just a remark that will be kappa classes, Mumford, so definition of Mumford kappa classes. So you see that when you, there is a forgetful map from mgn plus one to mgn, bar, let's call it pi, which is the forgetful map. So which means that you just forget the last mark point. Okay? If you take the class psi n plus 1 to the power k plus 1, sorry, so to the power k plus 1, you can push it forward. You can push forward that class. Uh, and basically, so I'm not, so what I'm going to write is not totally correct, I think, but basically this is the definition of the Mumford Kappa class. Or at least in each integral, that's what's going to happen. So basically integrating over the position of the last mark points will be equivalent to integrating the class kappa k. And it's a 2k form. So kappa 1 is a 2 form, kappa 2 is a 4 form, and so on. And kappa 0 is a number, and in fact kappa 0 is the Euler characteristic. <coughs> so that's useful for our purposes. Another thing which is useful is that, so somehow that's what this picture means here. Uh, well, my goal is to write a kind of Mumford or, or Kyodo formula in the end. But, uh, but so I need all the ingredients. So uh, you see that for each nodal surface, there is a kind of graphical representation of a nodal surface. And so let's call the dual graph. The dual graph will be a graph for which the components become vertices and the nodal points become edges. So here I have one component, one component, one component, one component. I have P1, P2. Here I have one nodal point, one nodal point. Here I have two nodal points relating to that component. Here I had one external leg on one external leg, okay? And I will record the genus of each component. So here it was genus zero, and there are four, there are four uh, special points on it. So let's say that it's a zero four. Here it's genus two and one special point. It's a two one. Here it was genus one with uh, three, with four special points. 1, 4, and here this was uh, 0, 3. But basically this graph encodes the boundary of MGN. So the boundary of MGN basically the boundary of MGN sits in MGN bar. 
And the boundary, so. No, here I'm talking about the boundary of MGN inside M bar GN. But MGN is open inside the uh, boundary. Okay. Okay, okay. I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit, okay, I'm, I'm very introductory here. I just want to say that I'm going to say how you go to a boundary, you just pinch a cycle somewhere. You create one nodal point. So uh, these are the one dimensional, the co-dimension one boundary. Uh, okay. Even boundaries may not be connected. Yeah, it's, it's not boundary rules, it's complex co-dimension boundary. Sorry? It's yes. not boundary in the Yes, okay. Uh, okay, I I'm, I'm just want to be very sketchy at this level. I just want to say that basically I want to write this thing that delta MGN, whatever that means, is basically, uh, is basically M G minus 1 uh, N plus uh, 2 plus sum of G1 plus G2 equal G sum of n1 plus n2 equals n of uh, m g1 n1 plus 1 m g2 n2 plus 1 well okay uh, okay on, on stable sorry yes okay i Okay, I just want to say that there is a map, in fact, uh, in that space. Sorry? Oh, sorry, sorry, not, uh, not tensor, sorry. It's just a product. Yeah, okay. Plus is union. Okay. And, and some here means union also. Okay, I just want to say that you have uh, certain classes of boundaries that are identified with either, basically with creating a nodal pot. And let me call that, so here I'm not going really to talk about boundaries, but classes of boundaries, so the corris corresponding to those different strata. So it's just, so I'm not so familiar with that notation, but I know how to compute the intersection numbers corresponding to that. And so I will call that map L, basically. And in fact, I will go from the equivalent, so from the classes of that into uh, classes of that. Okay. Okay. What I just want to say is that in practical computations, uh, I uh, basically I just want to explain the notations. Uh, and let me state the theorem because it's time very soon. Let me state the theorem. And I will first say what is the theorem for when there is only one ramification point on our spectral curve. And then I will write the theorem with an arbitrary number of uh, ramification points. So uh, case S, so which was my sigma x omega 0 1 omega 0 2, has one ramification point. And that is simple. And let's call it A. Okay, let's take this simpler example, which was the case for Mirzarani. We had only one ramification point. So uh, the theorem, uh, which is by me in 2010, and soon after I did the general case of arbitrary number of ramification points, but the theorem is the following that omega gn. Uh, or if you want the coefficients fgn, sorry, fgn of a d1 a dn is an integral over mgn, is 2 to the uh, dgn times uh, integral over mgn bar, so uh, Okay, no, sorry. Let me write it as intersection numbers. Uh, so there will be a, an intersection number, product from i equals 1 to n of psi di. Those, those are these di's. Uh, 
times a certain class. And what is that class? That class, I write it sum over k of t hat a k kappa k exponential one half of some of those boundary classes uh, uh, sum over k and l of b a k a l of the image basis l of the size corresponding to a nodal point. So, okay, let me write it this way, k psi p minus l. Okay, I will explain the notation. So basically, it's a kind of integral over mgn bar of some class, but we just need some explanation of how you compute this. <coughs> And if you want to recover omega gn, remember that omega gn of z1 zn was just the sum over d1 dn of fgn of d1 dn, sorry, a d1 a dn of chi a d1 of z1, chi a dn of zn. It was just that. And remember that these were the coefficients. Oh, it, was right. Right. it was psi before. So psi, it was some, some other letter. Sorry, it's, uh, sorry, it's psi i to the di. Yeah, but, but, but chi right. was, what it was some, some other letter. Did I? In your lecture today, it was different. The coefficients of the omega 0, 2, the Taylor coefficients of omega 0, 2? No, zeta was the local variable. Oh. And I think psi was the, so, so it was omega 0, 2 of z1, z2 was the, was the sum of zeta a of z1 to a 2k d zeta a of z1. And the coefficient was not psi a k of z2. Not psi, not k psi, yeah, psi. It was psi. Oh, it, oh sorry, it was psi, so, uh, sorry. You're right. <laughs> okay, you're right. So, uh, just one thing for the moment, I had defined sometimes t a k s, which were the coefficients of uh, of zeta to the two k plus one. Uh, so my omega zero one was basically one over t a zero uh, zeta plus sum over k. Uh, with zeta d zeta, okay? But you see, this is different names. Here I have t a k, and here I have t hat a k. These are not the same, but there is, but they are nearly the same. I would say it's just, a, I, I call that the short transform, but the idea is that if you take the Laplace transform of omega zero one uh, of z e to the minus u x of z, okay? Basically, if you expand this integral into powers of u, you will recover the ti case. Uh, there are some 2 to the k over 2k plus 1 double factorial or something like that. But you see, the Laplace transform is nice because somehow it will kill this denominator 2k plus 1 double factorial. Uh, but so if you do this Laplace transform, so just in order to make sure that it's well convergent, uh, that it has a, so let's kill the, uh, so 2u square root of u over square root of pi, I think if you take that now, so it's nearly the Laplace transform, uh, and here you will integrate over something which is the x minus 1 of x of a plus r plus, okay? So a certain contour, basically you extract the contour on which x of z minus x of a will be positive. So then the integral will be convergent. If you expand that into powers of u, basically you recover the ti case. But if you expand the, the log of that into powers of u, you recover those coefficients. So it's exponential sum over k minus sum over k of t hat k u minus k. 
So that's the definition of those coefficients t hat k. And it's very easy to compute. And the coefficient, those coefficients I had already defined. And remember that it was uh, basically omega 0, 2 of z1, z2 was uh, basically d zeta. Let's call it this way, d zeta 1, d zeta 2 over d zeta 1 minus d zeta 2 to the square. Uh, plus sum over k on L of uh, 2 to the k plus L over 2k minus 1 double factorial 2L minus 1 double factorial those coefficients b a k a l uh, zeta 1 to the 2k zeta 2 to the 2L d zeta 1 d zeta 2 ok ok let's then L delta, I think Sorry. it's actually a direct image on cohomology for empirical. But yeah, okay. I, I, I want to, but it's exactly, so I, I will give some examples, but I see that it's time nearly. I just want to, 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 to apply this in the case of Mirzarani to show that this directly implies Mirzarani's recursion. So what is 1 by i? i is square root of minus 1? Yeah. Uh, where is i? i e to the power 1 by i sigma over delta e to the in this intersection psi i psi i to the i nowhere no this is not square root of minus 1 so no wha what is this what what i are you talking about one half. It's a one half. Oh, it's a, oh, here it's a one half okay but well, what's l delta we know l but what's l delta okay i'm, I'm going to I'm going to say it in a moment. It's a one half. It's the image on the. So basically, it just means that you uh, push forward. Yeah, so it's the boundary divisor, and you take. So basically, uh, the boundary divisor corresponds to a nodal point, and the nodal point you identify to two points on the boundary divisor, and you can take the two uh, psi classes corresponding to the two points. So it just means that you push to the boundary divisor, uh, to the image by L of this boundary divisor. So it's just the image of those psi classes associated to the two, uh, two halves of a nodal point. So, and the fact that this is an exponential means that it's well defined only when you do some Taylor expansion. And in fact, this exponential will somehow means that you will have to do the sum over all possible dual graphs of all possible nodal surfaces. So you will, so when you tailor expand the exponential to first order you get one, to the next order you get basically one nodal point, to the next order you get two nodal points, then three nodal points and so on, and you cannot get more than 3g minus 3 plus n nodal points. Uh, okay, uh, and yes, another remark that this theorem says is that basically FGN, this FGN of A1, D1, uh, sorry, AD1, ADN is zero if D1 plus DN is larger than DGN. So that's what this theorem implies. In particular, it implies that only finitely many of those coefficients are non-zero. And that's what I said, it's a polynomial in the end. Only finitely many of them are, are non-zero. Remember that many of those intersection numbers, when, whenever you don't respect the dimension condition, all those intersection numbers are vanishing. So in fact, almost all terms in this sum are in fact vanishing, except a few of them. So, but let me do the example of Nirzarani. Well, if the dimension condition is satisfied, then the condition, if, if actual dimension is zero, then you have discrete points, and then yes. So uh, no. Then also, it's, it's not. What you mean? No, no. It, it, the condition you said that the dimension condition there. Yeah, so zero. some of the eyes, some of the eyes, and some of some of the degrees of all forms that appear in the thing, have to be the top dimension of, uh, of the space of MGM. 
have to be equal to dgn. So whenever the, the, the degree of a form is not the dimension of the space on which you want to integrate it, you, you get zero. That's what I'm saying. Okay, uh, so let's take an example. So which was, uh, so my curve, my spectral curve was, basically it was C, X of Z was Z squared, and Y of Z was minus one over four pi, uh, sorry, four pi sine two pi Z, and omega zero two of Z one, Z two, was just DZ one, DZ two, over z1 minus z2 to the square. Well, in that example, the local coordinate zeta is really equal to z. In that example, zeta, because of that, remember that zeta of z, which is square root of x of z minus x of a, and here in that example you have a equals zero, so this is just z. So which means that this one is precisely what you subtract when you do this Taylor expansion. So which means that in this example, you have B A K B uh, A L equals zero for all K L. So that will somehow, you will not be concerned by that term, <laughs> okay, in that example. But now what's interesting is to compute those questions C hat K. So when you want to compute those coefficients t hat k, you have to take an integral of e to the minus u x y dx. And you have to integrate from, so, uh, so basically of x of z, y of z dx of z. And you shall integrate z on just on r. Okay. Uh, just one remark, this is, so, sorry, r, r in the z variable, which means r plus in the x variable. Uh, so, uh, just one remark is that e to the minus ux y dx is just equal to 1 over u, x, so it's just integration by parts. Okay, it's convenient. So, in fact, what I want to write now is, instead of that, is dy of z. And 2 square root of u e to the, well, this one is just absent because x of 0, e x of the branch point is 0. So you want to compute that, which is 2 square root of u over square root of pi integral of e to the minus u z square, and here, uh, this is minus, so you have a minus 1 over 4 pi. But when you take the derivative of that, you have a 2 pi coming. So minus 1 over 2. Uh, and uh, so you get a cos 2 pi z, which I will write as exponential 2 pi i z plus exponential minus 2 pi i z dz, and there is a 1 over 2, so 1 over 4, so let me simplify, minus over 4 pi, if I'm correct, okay, and well, this is very easy to compute that integral, <laughs> it's fairly easy, and in the end what you find is that, so first it's two times the same integral, it's, so it's minus square root of u over 2 square root of pi, times, and basically you will get minus uh, uh, 1 over, uh, sorry, minus 2 pi square over u, is it what you find? Uh, sorry, minus pi square over u, no sorry, it's going to be minus pi square over u, and uh, basically is times square root of pi over square root of u. So which will be minus 1 over 2 exponential minus pi square over u. 
So which means that my t hat a1 is pi square, and my t hat a0 is the log of uh, minus log 2. Well, basically, all what I want to consider is this is minus 2. But so what does the theorem give? Sorry, I'm a little bit late. What does the theorem say is that omega gn of z1 zn is sum over d1 dn, product of, of uh, xi ai a di. But you can check that this is the same thing as 2 di minus 1 uh, sorry, plus one double factorial, d zeta i over two to the d i, zeta i to the two d i plus two times, and uh, here you have uh, psi one to the d one, psi n to the d n times exponential pi square kappa one. And you have this, sorry, and you had, remember you had 2 to the 2g minus 2 plus n. Uh, and we have this minus 2 to v, uh, sorry, 3g minus 3 plus n. And minus 2 to the power, so I must have made the mistake, uh, 2g minus 2 plus n. Uh, okay, if you are careful with the powers of 2 in the end, you recover. Uh, so this is the Weil Peterson class. And you see, in the end, these are indeed the hyperbolic volumes. So these are the hyperbolic volumes. So, so basically, this theorem proves that the hyperbolic volumes do satisfy the topological recursion. And in fact, we proceeded the other way around. We said that the solution of the topological recursion is the hyperbolic volumes using that theorem. So this proves Nirzarani. And you see, I, I like this proof because the most difficult part of the proof is to compute the Laplace transform of the sine function. <laughs> and if you apply the same thing to the Lambert function, you will find in, so again, you will have to compute the Laplace transform of the Lambert function, and the Laplace transform of the Lambert function is the gamma function. The exponential, so the, the Taylor expansion, uh, so, so the asymptotic expansion of the log of the gamma function is the Stirling formula. It involves the Bernoulli numbers, and with almost no efforts, you find the ELSV formula for all these numbers. And the most difficult part of the computation is to compute the Laplace transform of Lambert function and see that this is the gamma function. And, and so I like this proof. And, and also, if you take the, the, the mirror of C3, of the Calabio manifold C3, you take the mirror of C3, uh, again, you compute this Laplace transform, and it will be the beta Euler function, the Euler beta function, which is basically a product of three gamma functions. The mirror of C3 is basically the, the equation, yes, ah. e to the x plus e to the y uh, plus 1 uh, equals 0 or something like that. Okay? Well, you have to take a framing plus fy. You take a framing, f, okay? Uh, and if you compute the Laplace transform of that, so now compute e to the minus ux y dx, with y and x related by this formula, it's very easy to compute, and it's the be Euler beta function. So basically, it's something like gamma of u, gamma of uh, f u uh, divided by gamma of 1 plus f u, something like that. What are you talking about? What is C3 means? C3 three dimensional And it has a mirror. And it has a mirror. And this mirror is. It's that curve. Yes, it's something well known. I'm not going to enter the details, but just the most difficult part of the computation is to compute this Laplace transform, which is basically uh, which involves three gamma functions, 
And if you expand that into powers of u, uh, you get the sum over Bernoulli numbers b2k over 2k, 2k minus 1 times u to the minus 1 minus 2k. And since there are three of them, you have 1 plus f to the 2k plus 1 uh, minus uh, 1 plus f to the 2k plus 1. And it turns out that now if you take, sorry, and there is, I think, a minus, if you are careful. But now it turns out that if you take the exponential of sum of b2k, 2k, 2k minus 1, uh, and enough, now you replace this u by the class kappa, okay? And there is this plus one half of those boundary divisors. Well, plus on, on in fact, there are a few other terms. I don't want to enter the details, but this is basically what is called as the Hodge class. This is the Mumford formula. And uh, basically, what it says is that if you look at the mirror of C3, you apply the theorem, what you get is integrals involving a product of three Hodge classes. And it's the Marinovafa formula. So basically, we have a theorem, but in the same uh, theorem, you get Mirzarani's recursion, you get ELSV formula, you get Marinovafa formula, and you get many other things like that. In just, and the most difficult part of the computation you have to do is to compute the Laplace transform of some function. And I find it's beautiful. So next time I will show you what it gives when you have several branch points, and then it will be clearer what this sum of the boundary divisors really mean. But I, I don't want to enter this, and also the time is finished now. Thanks. <laughs>